I get a ton of questions about Milia, but it's not as straightforward as you would think to deal with, which is why I'm joined by double fellowship trained board certified dermatologist, Dr. Sheila Farhang. She is in Tucson, Arizona, and she's gonna answer all of our Milia questions. Hi, Dr. Sheila. Hi, Susan. Thank you so much for having me. We have a ton of questions. We asked all of the people in our Facebook group, our private Facebook group, and they really, I mean, I didn't realize how many questions they had. So are you ready? Let's get right into it. All right, so the first question is truly, what is milia? Because I think some people don't understand what it is. So you can think of milia as like a little tiny cyst. It almost has a cyst wall to it. And this is different than a whitehead or some other lesions that we may get on the face. And the milia is actually protein filled of, with keratin. Keratin is the cell kind of on the outer layer of our skin. It makes up our hair and that's why it looks white in appearance. And these are usually non-inflammatory and the causes are different as well. You know, I think when people hear that it's a cyst, they're thinking of like, you know, like a big ball under their skin, but milia tends to be really small and I've seen it two different ways. I've seen clusters of it. And then I've also seen just like one-off little bumps. They kind of look like whiteheads right? Exactly. So with cysts, if they are bigger, we're talking like Dr. Pimple Popper, sometimes they have to be removed by a surgery. But in a very similar way, milia actually also need to be removed or prevented or taken care of in a different way versus whiteheads. Whiteheads, they also have keratin filled elements, but they're mostly like an oil clogged pore type of thing for acne. And with milia, it's keratin based. And so um, you can't really pop it with it coming out of, you know, making a head and popping it. It takes a little bit more than that. And the causes are just really that our skin exfoliates over time. And when it gets built up and kind of think about not making its way out, that is a cause of milia. So we have primary milia and that's caused by just occlusion or the skin just not regenerating. A lot of times we do get them around the eye. And then we have the secondary type of form, which is from trauma. Some blistering diseases can also do it. So milia is truly uh, on the face, right? They can be, although I've seen them, you know, I'm a dermatologist, so I do skin check exams. And so I definitely see them in the hair. They are in areas where, you know, you have more sebaceous glands. And this can be confused with many other things such as syringomas. They're actually from sweat glands, not the oil glands. And so if you ever has, have any question about what they are, definitely go see a dermatologist and don't just assume maybe that they're milia because they're like little bumps on the face. All right, so let's get into the causes of milia because I think that's truly where people get confused because I've heard things like genetics can cause it, wearing, you know, really thick occlusives, like thick moisturizers and eye creams and stuff. So I want to hear from you, what are the causes? The milia is caused by just our skin cells getting stuck and not regenerating. And there are certain things that may cause it, such as the occlusives, as you said. And so if we are dealing with kind of milia around the eye area, things like mineral oil, petrolatum, the things that are a little occlusive can cause milia formation. And if someone just has milia because just the genetics of their skin is not, they're not maybe exfoliating as much, maybe the skin is just not exfoliating as good as it used to. And we actually see this around the eye because the skin is so thin and it doesn't have like a lot of integrity. So if it has like integrity, like the cheek maybe, then it can kind of work. It's not so thin and saggy in that area. Another thing is like, really, really bad sun damage. You know how it, the skin gets really kind of leathery almost. So those mm -hmm. people tend to get milia in the areas as well. Some myths that I have heard from my patients or just kind of browsing the internet is that it is can you know related to food or cholesterol that's false from what we know so far could you maybe say that a really healthy diet or possibly cutting out some or maybe minimizing some dairy if you feel like that maybe causes breakouts because now we know that's proven to cause acne and whiteheads 
in an inflammatory type of way. It's not so much related to milia, although I always say, listen to your skin. If you feel like something is breaking out because of a certain food and it's inflammatory or anything like that, and listen to it. But there's no right. data really to suggest a direct correlation. How about genetics? Is it, you know, if your mom has lots of milia, are you then potentially prone to getting milia as well? It's a great question. So there are a subset of just genetic syndromes, really kind of severe ones that people get milia. These are blistering disorders, unfortunately. But if we kind of talk about just the normal type of skin that is not a disease or anything like that, Sometimes it can be more of a lifestyle type of thing. As we mature, the skin thins out, maybe a little bit more sun damage. So just because maybe your mom or someone in your family has tons of milia doesn't necessarily mean that you will because there's a lot of factors that go into it. And there's definitely ways to prevent it and, and treat them as well. How about certain ethnicities? Because I feel like people think that if they're Asian or if they're black, they're more prone to milia as well. What do you think about that? Different ethnicities do have different skin thickness, maybe hair bearing areas, maybe a little bit more oily in some areas. And so I wouldn't say necessarily that one ethnicity is more prone to the other just by ethnicity, but really it's the, it's the kind of the whole picture. What is the lifestyle? Where do they live? Is it a really, really dry area? What's their skincare regimen? Where are they getting it? And things like that. And again, it could be just not milia and something else. And then when it comes to the occlusives, you know, somebody using a thick eye cream or using something like, you know, I, slugging is in right now where they put petrolatum on their face and stuff. Um, it's not necessarily because the ingredients are causing it. It's just that the way that their skin is reacting to having an occlusive like that. Is that kind of what I'm getting from it? It is the ingredient, but it's not because of the ingredient, I guess, right? Yes, exactly. It's not the actual ingredient causing it. It's what the ingredient is doing to the skin, which is occluding the, the, the area. And so things, if you want to say a lot of really oily makeup removers around the eye area, can clog these areas and potentially cause milia. I always recommend like a micellar water for eye makeup remover. I love micellar water. You know, although I love Vaseline petrolatum for the lips, I wouldn't really um, recommend it for full face use um, unless it's after peel and things like that. And so I think that being aware of the products that you're using is really important. All right, so then let's get into the treatments for milia because I think that's where people feel like they're really at a loss. I think we should start with maybe prevention first, right? Absolutely, prevention is key, especially when it comes to skincare. I Try to keep things really simple. You know, of course I recommend a gentle cleanser in the morning. I do recommend a vitamin C antioxidant after that, and then your sunscreen SPF. But what can you do in addition to this during the daytime routine? And you have to really kind of be careful because a lot of these exfoliants, particularly the chemical exfoliants, lactic acid, glycolic acid, the BHAs can make your skin a lot more sensitive. And so a lot of times I do recommend these during the nighttime routine or once or twice a week, but say we are wanting to do something for our morning routine, I would say a good just more moisturization is key. And that way you're getting a good skin barrier because I'm all about let's give it good skin health because if you're flaking, maybe your dead skin's getting kind of caught in there and you're not regenerating your skin. And so moisturization is key and of course sunscreen. So now mm -hmm. let's go really into the PM treatments, which is again, your gentle cleanser. Instead of your gentle cleanser, there are a lot of good cleansers out there that are exfoliants and also your aha baha and i really like this as a one to two time treatment during the week especially if you're prone to getting milia or acne or anything like that so say you're getting milia around the eye area both a prevention and really a treatment is an eye cream that is retinol based and not all mm. eye creams are retinol based but this would be something that'll help regenerate the skin and remember you can't use your retinols that you use on your face on your eyelids because eyelid is the thinnest skin on our body so you're basically saying that um instead of using like if you're using tretinoin on the rest of your face 
on the eye area, kind of keep that more at like a minimum, like yeah. a minimal Don't percentage even. or something, or maybe even go just o- o- like retinol. Yeah, exactly. That's a really good question. I don't recommend unless there's a specific like medical reason why I want them to do it. And I'm really watching for it. Tretinoin, especially prescription strength, shouldn't be used around the eye. All of these things, the retinols, the exfoliants, help regenerate the skin and help slough off the skin in a safe way. All right, so let's talk about the ingredients to use at home for prevention and treatment. So as we discussed, the cause of milia is the skin not being able to like regenerate, the skin cells basically get stuck and then we get the, the little form as little cyst basically. And so a couple of the ingredients that I recommend are chemical exfoliants such as lactic acid or the glycolic acid, salicylic acid, and then retinols increase cell turnover. And so this is a really good gold standard that anyone can use at night, except for if you're pregnant, that really helps both prevent and can also treat a lot of these milia forming. Would you say that finding a product that maybe combines the BHAs and the AHAs or the ahas and the bahas, I love that you call them that because it makes it sound so fun and cute, but you think more of like the combination is is the way to, to treat it? Yeah, absolutely. You can hit it from all ways, you know, and that's kind of what I like with my products as well, making sure that they, they are multifunctional in the way and that they're targeting different things in the skin. So would this be potentially a time where where people should look for also maybe physical exfoliants, or do you think that sh- they should stay away from them if they have milia? I'm more of a chemical exfoliant gal because uh, you know we've all heard the St. Ives and all that, but oh yeah, know, totally. <laughs> mechanical exfoliants they are you know pretty rough on the skin, and although some people can tolerate them and they just love that that clean feel afterwards, I would limit it to maybe one or two times a week. But if you can't tolerate it, you don't have to use one. There are some products out there that are a little bit of both. And so if your skin is able to tolerate them, then you can definitely do that. If you do have those milia around the eye, I actually would not recommend using a mechanical exfoliant for those areas, only because this is the thinnest skin on our body and excessive rubbing or trauma can actually make it look like you have dark circles and things like that. So you definitely wanna keep it super, super gentle on the eyelid skin. And you know, I will say using a lot of these exfoliants and the retinols will help the milia. Sometimes they kind of just go away the skin sloughing will happen and they'll kind of make their way out. I wouldn't really recommend popping these because they're not, I really don't recommend popping whiteheads either, but definitely not milia because they're not really gonna get anywhere. And if you did pop it out, we did a lot of damage and you can get a little pit scar that is permanent. So, you know, these will help them over time, but say you just want to get rid of them ASAP, then a trip to your friendly dermatologist is going to be really helpful because some of the treatments for milia, because you have to think of it as like a little cyst that has a wall around it, doesn't have like a little opening or anything like that. And so we can lance them, like incise and drain them in a very sterile setting, called like acne surgery. That way we do it in a way where you're really not gonna get a lot of the scarring. There are some more aggressive peels with similar ingredients as the chemical exfoliants that we were talking about. And so I love doing that for a lot of my patients who have almost those under the skin bumps. And then we have some kind of more mechanical ways. Sometimes I can do something called electro desiccation, which is a little bit of heat to kind of destroy the top layer. I say there's like a lot of small ones everywhere. Like you said, some people kind of get them in patches. So that's a treatment. Cryo is a treatment. Really strong peels that are really localized to the lesions are a treatment. So there's kind of an array of treatments that you can do to actually get rid of them as well Mm -hmm. as prevent them if the at-home stuff is not working out. So if you tend to be the kind of person that has milia, does it mean you're probably just gonna always be prone to milia? You know, it, it could be, but again, if you are like on point with the prevention, which is like doing the exfoliants, making sure your skin is nice and hydrated with the ceramides, 
then, you know, you could just have a few, you know, get them treated and then not get really any more, just kind of just depending. Everyone is really different. I think that, you know, even seeing a, a really knowledgeable esthetician, because I know it sometimes can be really difficult to see a dermatologist and sometimes expensive too, depending on where you are, access, if you have a really good esthetician, sometimes it can help you with that, but you just have to balance it with making sure you're not destroying the other parts of your skin by just focusing on the milia. And then the last question is, does milia go away on its own? Can you just kind of let it be? You know, sometimes you can just let it be and it'll go away in a few weeks, especially if you are using a lot of these at-home skincare products that we discussed. If it's kind of tagging along or it's kind of hardened, because keratin, those skin cells can sometimes leave like almost like a bead in there, it feels like. Then at that point, it may be a little bit more stubborn and that's when you need to see your dermatologist or esthetician to almost mechanically remove it with some type of form. All right, Dr. Sheila, thank you so much for answering all of these questions about milia. Where can people find you online if they have additional questions? For sure, thank you so much for having me. So people can follow me on Instagram at Dr. Sheila underscore Derm, or I just started a YouTube channel, which is Dr. Sheila Derm. So thank you so much again for having me. And hopefully we get to do this again. Yeah, definitely. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.